Hello, my name's Dr Gemma Sharp and I work at the MRC Integrative Epidemiology Unit at the University of Bristol in the UK. I'm going to be talking about an approach to epidemiological research known as triangulation and explaining how I'm applying this approach in my research into prenatal influences on childhood health. It's well accepted that mothers can influence the health of their children, either via direct genetic inheritance or by shaping the pre or postnatal environment and the level of care. But what's less well recognised and less well studied is that there are also many potential ways that fathers might influence the health of their children. Um, and we outlined uh, this in a recent review published in uh, Diabetologia in 2019. Um, the figure on the right is from that review. Again, the most obvious genetic effect is through um, genetic inheritance of genetic predispositions to disease, but also through genetic mutations in sperm cells. The non-genetic makeup of sperm cells, so things like epigenetics, might also influence development of the fetus. And of course, fathers can also influence the environment that their children develop in after birth. And they can have uh, indirect influences on child and fetal health through their influence on the mother. So for example, by exposing her to passive smoke, uh, domestic violence, or providing emotional and practical support for her before um, and after the birth of the child. But research on the developmental origins of health and disease, or DOHAD, has overwhelmingly focused on the effects of maternal exposures around the time of pregnancy. So this is an updated version of a, a graphic that I included in a commentary co-authored by uh, Deborah Lawler and uh, Sarah Richardson and published in 2018. So it's simply the number of PubMed articles published each year since 2000 that come up when you search for DOHAD terms. So things like developmental origins, fetal origins, Barker hypothesis, and then either mother or maternal in peach or father or paternal in green. And perhaps unsurprisingly, we can see the number of maternal papers dwarfs the number of paternal papers. And if we zoom in on the paternal papers, we can see that they are going up, but there are still about 10 times fewer paternal than maternal articles being published each year. In another study published at the start of 2019, we showed that in the main journal for this field, 81% of studies considered maternal exposures only, so that's the uh, yellow inner circle. 3% um, studied maternal exposures and paternal exposures in the same paper, that's that green inner segment, and only one study, so 0.3%, studied paternal exposures without maternal exposures. That's that tiny blue strip in the inner circle. So we think this over-focus on maternal factors is problematic because it contributes to a culture of blame around pregnant women and mothers. And it could mean that we're potentially missing other important targets for interventions to improve offspring health. So for example, very little health advice is currently given to fathers-to-be, whereas women are, are bombarded with it. So I think there's a need to look at both maternal and paternal prenatal effects on offspring health. And that can help to contextualise both the maternal and the paternal effect. But another issue with the field is that much of the evidence is correlative and doesn't provide um, robust causal evidence and so this means that pregnancy advice offered to mothers can be confusing and not evidence-based. So in addition to contextualising the field by studying factors other than maternal pregnancy exposures, we also need to drill down a bit more to see whether when we see a correlation between a parental exposure and an offspring outcome, is it because that exposure actually causes the outcome or is does that correlation exist because of confounding, including confounding introduced by the same exposure in the other parent?
So I set up the EPOC study, the Exploring Prenatal Influences on Childhood Health study, to try to improve the causal evidence base around prenatal influences on childhood health. The study involves meta-analysing summary statistics from seven European birth cohorts and uh, triangulating evidence garnered using different methods to improve and contextualise the causal evidence base around maternal and paternal prenatal influences on childhood health. But what do I mean by triangulation? So the concept is discussed in detail in this 2017 paper published by uh, Deborah Lawler, Kate Tilling and George Davy Smith. And these are all senior academics in the department where I work. The term itself comes from surveying where triangulation is the process of determining the location of a point by measuring only angles to it from other known points. So triangulation may be used to find the position of the ship when the positions of angles, uh, the positions and angles of A and B are known using the known mathematical properties of triangles. The term is also used to describe an approach in qualitative and quantitative research. This approach involves obtaining more accurate or reliable answers to research questions by comparing results from two or more different methods. So similarly uh, to in surveying, there's a measure that cannot easily be obtained and you estimate that measure from different locations. In epidemiology, we're used to integrating uh, evidence. So this might be through um, independent replication of um, findings or validation of findings, um, systematic review and meta-analysis. And these approaches seek to compare and sometimes combine results from the same study design or approach under the assumption that they are all unbiased and estimating the same underlying causal effect. But this is not triangulation. So these are some criteria for triangulation. So results um, need to come from at least two, but ideally more different approaches with uh, differing and unrelated key sources of potential biases. The different approaches need to address the same underlying causal question. And for each approach, the key sources of bias are explicitly acknowledged when comparing results. For each approach, the expected direction of all key sources of potential bias are made explicit where this is feasible. Ideally, there are approaches with potential biases that um, are in opposite directions. And for each approach, the duration and timing of exposure that it, that it assesses is taken into account when comparing results. So here are some examples of approaches that could be triangulated. So we have conventional approaches like randomised control trials and uh, multivariable regression, and then refinement of um, those approaches using uh, the general population. So for example, cross context comparisons, um, where you uh, um, ask the same question in populations uh, that uh, occur in different contexts and maybe have different um, confounding structures. Um, you could use different control groups and again these different control groups um, might have different uh, confounders associated with them or natural experiments. Um, there are refinements using specific populations so for example within sibling comparisons which I'll talk a little bit more about and refinement of exposure. So um, here we're talking about instrumental variable analysis and particularly um, as, I'll, as I'll discuss later, um, genetic instrumental variables, uh, which is an approach known as Mendelian randomization. Um, and uh, we can also use negative controls. So you can either use negative um, exposure controls or, or negative outcome controls. And this refers to um, looking at our traits of interest in relation to um, something um, that we think would not be associated with them, but might have um, similar confounding structures to uh, our 
to something that we think might be causally associated with them. And I'll explain a little bit more about exposure negative controls um, later in this presentation. So different study designs and analysis approaches have different and unrelated key assumptions. And violation of these assumptions will have different and unrelated uh, biasing influences on effect estimates. And I'll discuss some of these assumptions as we go. So in EPOC, um, we're triangulating the following methods to study the causal effect of maternal or paternal health behaviours in the prenatal period on uh, childhood health outcomes. So multivariable regression, Mendelian randomization, negative control comparisons and sibling comparisons. And these are the key assumptions made by each method. And I'm going to talk you through an example using some preliminary results from EPOC and some evidence previously published by other groups. Uh, this example concerns the effect of maternal smoking on offspring birth weight, which is an already well characterised um, effect, but it illustrates the various approaches that we're using. So first of all, um, multivariable regression. So to do um, this analysis, I used data from uh, the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children, or ALSPAC, um, and I looked at maternal smoking at any point during pregnancy um, as a binary variable and birth weight uh, measured in grams and then uh, converted into Z scores. Um, and so this was just a logistic uh, regression model. The top um, effect estimate shows a completely crude um, uh, effect estimate and the bottom one shows um, the effect estimate adjusted for potential confounders. So um, age, uh, maternal age, uh, parity, um, BMI, um, alcohol, socioeconomic status, um, and sex of the child. Um, and as we can see, uh, adjusting for potential confounders moves the, attenuates the um, effect estimate towards the null uh, slightly um, but it still looks like there is a strong effect of maternal smoking on offspring birth weight. Um, so this is fine but as we as, as you probably know it doesn't account for unmeasured confounding so it's very difficult to measure all factors associated with both the exposure and the outcome and it's also very difficult to think of every possible confounder and include it in statistical models. And there may be um, residual confounding. So even though we've adjusted for some confounders, if those confounders are measured with error, then they won't be fully controlled for in our regression models. So um, we may have modelled uh, and, and we may have also modelled some confounders incorrectly. So there may be some residual bias in our estimate for multivariable regression. So using um, a slightly different approach, this is a, a variation on multivariable regression. So it uses multivariable regression, but um, but this time um, we're using a negative control design. So the negative control involves selecting an exposure that we don't think will have a causal effect on our outcome of interest. So for example, um, paternal smoking during pregnancy is unlikely to have a causal intrauterine effect on fetal growth. So um, paternal smoking can affect, um, can, can uh, expose the mother to passive smoking, um, which we but we would expect that to have a smaller effect than maternal active smoking. And also paternal smoking in the preconception period might have a causal effect on birth weight via um, effects on sperm, for example. Um, but again, we wouldn't expect this to occur via an intrauterine effect. And so we would expect there to be a different effect estimate um, from, um, from what, we would, uh, what we would see if the effect of paternal smoking on offspring um, birth weight was just explained by um, confounding or correlation with um, maternal smoking. So we think paternal smoking would be correlated with many of the same shared environmental familial confounders as maternal smoking. So the same confounding structure 
but no or a different mechanism of action. So the Maternal Smoking Birth Weight uh, Association here is compared to the Paternal Smoking Birth Weight Association and we see a larger maternal than paternal effect um, and this provides uh, some evidence of causality. So um, in both of these estimates are what we term mutually adjusted in that the maternal smoking estimate is adjusted for paternal smoking and vice versa. And this is important because the behaviours are likely to be correlated. So we, we haven't um, conducted sibling and sibling comparisons in EPOC yet because so far we've just been working on ALSPAC and the um, and that cohort is uh, too small and, and, and recruited over too too short a um, a study period for um, uh, to have many siblings in the study um, but we do plan to conduct sibling comparisons in some of the larger cohorts so in MOBA and um, the Danish national birth cohort um, but just to explain, uh, sibling comparison studies are a special type of matched study design, which allow us to control for multiple known and unknown, so measured and unmeasured, confounding factors introduced by genetics and shared environment. And it involves comparing outcomes in siblings that are discordant for the exposure and therefore assumes that um, all observed and unobserved confounders are matched and there's little or no um, individual confounding. Um, so as I say, we don't have results to show you from EPOC yet, but um, this uh, paper um, published in 2013 by uh, Juarez and Merlo uh, found that um, in a conventional analysis, so they use Swedish registry data, so um, very large sample size, um, and they found that in a conventional analysis, um, uh, babies of mothers um, that smoked were between uh, 221 and 303 grams lighter, depending on the level of exposure, so the level of maternal smoking. Whereas in a sibling analysis, um, they were be between 162 and 259 grams lighter, depending on the level of exposure. So the sibling analysis provides uh, strong evidence that maternal uh, smoking reduces offspring birth weight. But this reduction was not as great as that observed in the conventional analysis. And so finally, um, the final uh, approach that I'm going to talk to you about is Mendelian randomization. So this is a technique based on the idea that genetics can tell us about non-genetic factors and their effects on health and disease. So it uses uh, genetic information as a proxy for non-genetic information, allowing us to test for causal effects in the presence of confounding. And it's about testing causal effects of potentially modifiable risk factors. So things like uh, smoking and BMI and vitamin C, etc., rather than the effects of genes themselves. So Mendelian randomization takes advantage of the features of genetics by employing genetic information as proxies or instruments for exposures of interest in a special type of instrumental variable analysis. The research question we're discussing in this talk is, does exposure X, maternal smoking, causally affect outcome Y, uh, birth weight? So if X causes Y, it follows that any factor that influences X will also influence Y. And we call these factors instruments and they're labelled here as Z. Um, and genetic effects can serve as excellent instruments. And this is because virtually all traits are at least partially influenced by genetic effects. Um, genetic variants are inherited from parents at random and then independ and independently from other variants. So they're unlikely to be affected by confounding. In a genetic association, the direction of causation is from the gene uh, genetic variant to the trait of interest and not vice versa. So we don't have to worry about um, reverse causation. 
Um, and genetic variants and their effects are subject to relatively little measurement error or bias, especially compared to um, self-report questionnaire data. The measured genetic variant doesn't have to actually cause the exposure, so it, and it could just be in linkage disequilibrium or LD with the causal variant, so just, um, just linked to it. And also genetic data are now routinely available on large, well-phenotyped studies. So Mendelian randomization, the way this works is that it emulates a randomized control trial. So in our example, to address the question of whether smoking causally affects birth weight, we could conduct an RCT. So in RCTs, as, as you probably know, randomly assigning participants to either the treatment or control arm avoids potential confounding between the intervention and the outcome. We could randomly assign some pregnant women to smoke and some to not. If Then if birth weight was lower in the group randomised to smoke um, and all other assumptions were met, we could infer that smoking causally affects birth weight. But of course, we can't do this. Um, so we know that smoking is unhealthy for both the mother and the child. So this would be completely unethical and immoral. So Mendelian randomization uh, to the rescue. So Mendelian randomization e emulates a randomized control trial. Instead of randomly assigning some women to smoke and some um, Instead, some women have naturally been randomly assigned to lower or higher on average propensities to smoke through their genetic makeup. And Mendelian randomization takes advantage of this. So in MR, if a um, particular genetic variant is robustly related to an exposure, people with that variant are effectively being assigned a higher on average dosage of that exposure and people without that variant are assigned a lower on average dosage. So if the exposure, in this case smoking, causally affects the outcome, in this case birth weight, we can therefore expect people with, with the particular genetic variant to have a higher rate of the outcome, so a higher rate of low birth weight than those that uh, did not inherit it. And as with an RCT, because the genetic variants are randomly assigned during meiosis, they should be unrelated to confounders. Mendelian randomization makes several assumptions that should be met, especially if the research aim is to estimate the precise magnitude of the causal effect of X on Y rather than just to infer whether or not a causal effect exists. And again, we can, we can draw uh, parallels between many of the assumptions of MR and those of RCTs. So there are three main assumptions. The first is that the instrument must be robustly associated with the exposure. So in MR, the genetic variant must be robustly associated with the exposure. And in an RCT, randomization to the treatment must affect levels of the exposure. The second assumption is that the instrument is not associated with any measured or unmeasured confounding factors in MR. The uh, genetic variant must be randomized with respect to confounders. And in an RCT, the intervention must be randomized with respect to confounders. The third assumption is that the instrument is associated with the outcome only via its association with the exposure. So in MR, the genetic variant should not affect the outcome via a pathway that does not involve the exposure. So this is known as horizontal pleiotropy. And in an RCT, there should be no direct effect of the intervention on the outcome. Um, MR additionally assumes that all the associations, uh, so Z to X, X to Y, Z to Y, and the associations with the confounders, are all linear and not subject to interactions. And there are various sensitivity analyses that you can um, conduct to test these assumptions. So I uh, conducted a Mendelian randomization study um, really just for the purposes of this um, talk, uh, although this approach will be used in EPOC um, when we get going. Um, 
I give this caveat because uh, I didn't test all of the assumptions here. Um, so I used a multi-SNP allele score for uh, smoking heaviness and this um, the information to, to derive this allele score comes from um, the G-Scan consortium, um, which is a, a GWAS of, um, a large GWAS of, uh, of smoking. Um, and, and specifically, this looked at smoking heaviness, so number of cigarettes per day. Um, so as I say, I didn't uh, test for all the assumptions here, but I did adjust for child's allele score to try to control for the correlation between maternal and child genetics. So this correlation could open a, um, a pathway between uh, Z, the maternal um, allele score, so our instrument, and um, the outcome um, Y, uh, birth weight, directly through um, child's genetics. And so this is what I'm trying to uh, get around by by adjusting for it. And, um, and this this approach is discussed in more detail in this paper. So this paper published by uh, Deborah Lawler et al. Uh, you'll notice that um, De Deborah's name comes up a lot in the Mendelian randomization and DOHAD literature. Um, and there are various different ways you can try to control for that correlation. Um, and adjusting for child's allele score is the one that's most commonly used. Um, so what does this tell us? Well, it looks like there's little evidence of effect according to this Mendelian randomization. As you can see, the um, confidence intervals are wide and they do cross the null. However, it's worth considering that one of the limitations of Mendelian randomization is that it does need large samples. And this was in one cohort. So it suffers from low statistical power. It also looks like adjusting for the child allele score attenuates the effect further towards the null, pretty much um, uh, to the null. Um, but again, it's worth considering that taking this approach may in fact be biasing estimates um, in some situations um, and it could, it could sometimes be the wrong thing to do. So it is done as a kind of sensitivity analysis. So maybe some more um, reliable um, results uh, of Mendelian randomization looking um, at the effect of smoking on birth weight are needed. And thankfully, this study uh, was uh, published uh, in 2019, and it's a much larger study of maternal smoking on birth weight conducted in the UK Biobank using a different but related Mendelian randomization approach. And in this study, which is, as I say, probably more reliable than my preliminary analysis in ASPAC, um, there is a strong support for a causal effect of smoking on birth weight. So now we come to, to triangulate the results. So in this example, we actually uh, find pretty consistent results um, across the different approaches. And this means that we can be more confident that maternal smoking causally affects birth weight. But what if we'd found uh, conflicting results? Well, then we'd have to assess the various effect estimates and sources of bias and make more nuanced uh, inferences. Um, there's currently no formal underpinning to triangulation. So at the moment, it involves qualitative synthesis of evidence, which really makes you kind of think through all of the potential biases. Um, but there are attempts underway to develop formal quantitative triangulation methods, including um, meta-analysis of the effect estimates generated by each approach, and then assessment of the heterogeneity statistics to inform us about the consistency and bias of our um, of the uh, of the effect estimates generated by the various approaches. And if you are um, interested in this, people working um, in this field include uh, Professor Kate Tilling at the University of Bristol. So, in summary. The EPOC study triangulates evidence from various causal inference approaches to improve the causal evidence base and contextualize information about both maternal and paternal influences on childhood health. 
Triangulation involves comparing evidence about the same causal question garnered using different approaches with different and unrelated key sources of potential biases. Examples of causal inference approaches from epidemiology that can be triangulated include multivariable regression, negative control comparisons, within sibling comparisons and Mendelian randomization. And triangulation currently involves a qualitative synthesis of evidence, but formal approaches are under development. So finally, I just like to uh, thanks, thank the organisers for inviting me to talk at this meeting and thank you for listening. And also thanks to the many collaborators working on this project with me. And in particular, thanks to Kaylee Easy, the uh, postdoc that's helped me prepare and harmonise all the data and will soon start uh, analysis. And of course, I'd like to thank all the cohort participants that have provided their data. Mm -hmm.